Good morning, Faith Family Church. Man, I am glad to be in the house of God today. You know, it's really His grace. I want you to know that. The fact that you're sitting here today, you tied your shoes, hopefully you brush your teeth, it is all because of His grace and His mercy. There is no doubt about it. Um, as Pastor Grant said, I get to serve as Pastor Josh and Pastor Kara's overseers. For several years, I tried to hire them uh, to come and be on my staff in Northwest Arkansas, but they're uh, persistent about planting a church. And I remember like it was yesterday, going and seeing that high school where he thought maybe they should rent to plant the church a little more than 10 years ago. And I said, Josh, you need to get this church, this school right now. And it's been an amazing 10 years, hadn't it, church? Yes. Well, turn with me to Luke chapter 5, because today we're going to study the Bible. And um, I want to uh, speak to a certain group of people that are in here right now. Um, do I have any Yale leaders in the house? Any A&M, Texas A&M fans, all right? Yeah, she's got her shirt on, all right? I need y'all to focus for me, all right? I know the game. They may win their first national championship in the history of the university or in any sport. Today, I'm kidding, all right? All you UT people are laughing, you know. I'm an LSU boy. I went to LSU, grew up in Baton Rouge. Go Tigers! Yeah, I can talk Cajun. My grandmother didn't know English till third grade. She's fluent in Cajun French. But anyway, everybody say Jesus. I'm going to need some help today when I preach, all right? So this section over here, when I point to you, I want you to say, oh, yeah. Right here, I want you to say, let's go. Over here, I want you to say, that's right. You have to say it with an attitude like, oh, that's right. Very good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And I thank you that Faith Family Church has built this church on your word, not opinion, not public philosophy or theology or personal theology, but Lord, your word. And I thank you today, your word's going to go forth. And Lord, your word carries truth with it. So Lord, I pray that every person here is going to incline their ear to hear what they need to hear. And Lord, I thank you, your word, when it's planted into our hearts, will grow a harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's what we need today, God. We need heaven results in our life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Now, raise your hand if you like brand new, fresh socks. You know, you, know, you raise your hand, you didn't know what I was doing. I'm a, sno I'm a sock snob, all right? I am a freak. I know I, have, I go to therapy concerning this. I'm a work in progress. I've got, I've got certain drawers for certain pair of socks. I've got my white long socks in this drawer, my black long socks in this drawer, my gray long socks in this drawer, my low ankle white socks in this drawer, my low ankle black socks. I kid you not, all right? And it's there, like if I buy a pair of white socks, it's the same brand, and I throw the other ones away because I don't want to get an Under Armour sock and a Nike sock and that's it. No, no, that would throw my day off, all right? I know, I know. I have some issues. I'm working through them. But I just feel like Oprah today, all right? So I want you to have some new socks. Let me see how... There we go. Hopefully I don't take out any lights. There we go. Man, I just feel the spirit of Mardi Gras all over me right now. You get a new pair of socks. You get a new pair of socks. See Oprah coming out. You get a new pair of socks. Yeah. She gave out cars. Why are you giving out socks, all right? Because that's not how I roll, all right? I like socks. You get that bag right there, all right? <laughs> Wasn't worship great today? Man, that girl who sang the third, that third song, gee, man, whoo. They asked me to lead that song. I said, no, let her do it. She got it, all right? <laughs> Come on now. There we go. There we go. It's awesome getting a pair of new socks because they're crisp, they're fresh, they're, they're awesome to put on. And Isaiah, I know you're thinking, how is, how's he going to connect that to the message? Watch this, all right? 
Isaiah prophesies that every day we can have a moment like putting on a brand new pair of fresh socks. He said this in Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a what? That word new in the Hebrew, you know what it means? Come on now. Fresh. Mm. God wants to do a new, fresh thing in your life. The fact that you're sitting here right now tells me and confirms this prophetic word that was given to us 700 years before Christ walked on this earth. God wants to do a new thing in your life. He wants to do a new thing in your marriage, with your children, your grandchildren. He does. Stop thinking otherwise because it is a lie and it is not the truth. Start expecting God to do something new in your life. In fact, Lamentation says it this way. Verse 22 in chapter 3, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. It never ends. Because when it ends, he's going to wipe us off the earth because that's how bad we are. That's how human we are. His faithfulness, it never ends. His mercies never cease. Great, verse 23, great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. This Hebrew word takes fresh to a whole nother level, which means when you wake up each morning, God wants to bring new joy after a night of distress. Let me speak prophetically over someone's life in here. You may have been weeping last night wondering, God, do you hear me? God, do you even understand that I'm here Yes, he does. He hears your cry. He is attentive to the cry of the righteous, and he will be there for you. Amen? His mercies are new and afresh every morning, every day. He is inviting you in your marriage, in your parenting, in your leadership, in your career. He's inviting you to new levels, and that's the title of my message. It's the invitation of a lifetime. Now, let me give you a little context to what's going on in Luke chapter 5 to boost and stir up your faith, all right? Jesus, no pun intended, but he's fresh into his new earthly ministry, all right? He's, he's just right out of the blocks, all right? And he's off to a miraculous start, you'd have to say, because that's how Jesus rolls. We see in Luke chapter 5, right at the beginning, Jesus is inviting two sets of brothers to a new thing. It's, He's giving them this invitation of the lifetime. He invites Peter and Andrew, and he invites James and John. And the invitation is to come follow him and be a disciple. That's what it says. Jesus said, hey, 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 God, say, come follow me and be a disciple. And Scripture says, at once they left everything and followed him. We see Jesus moments after that intersect with a gentleman who had an advanced case of leprosy. And Pastor Grant just just spoke about that in the ministry transition. If you had leprosy in this culture, you are an outcast. And Jesus intersects with this man. he's, He's in this severe loneliness, and he's got this case of leprosy, and he's got some faulty theology. He actually asked Jesus, think how foolish this is, if you are willing You can heal me. To which Jesus cleared up his theological mess. Oh, yes, I am willing. I I, I am most certain that I can handle this. Then he invites this man to a new social life because we know he is an outcast. He had no life. Jesus brings healing to this man. You could imagine this invitation. Instantly healed. Then we see Jesus later on that afternoon teaching doing what he does best. He is just teaching. Word is out about Jesus and what he's doing. People come to this house. They pack the house. It is packed. Nobody can get in. Nobody can get out. It is packed. Jesus is preaching. You can imagine the anointing. And here come four men carrying a friend who's paralyzed on a mat. So just picture with me how this looks, all right? So here's four men. They each have a corner of the mat. Maybe there's a rope tied to it over their shoulder, and they're walking trying to get this man to Jesus because they've been hearing that Jesus can heal. So they get up to the house. It's packed. They can't get in. And instead of going back, they decide, hey, let's dig a hole in the roof. 
To which the man in the mat said, oh, that's a bad idea, guys. You literally want to lower me down? I mean, like, look, I'm okay, uh, but if you drop me, I might lose my life. No, 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 you're going to get in front of Jesus. We're going to take you and put you down in front of Jesus because we're tired. We've been carrying you all day long. you walking back with us, all right? Let me say something about friends. You better have a friend in your life that when you can't walk on your own can get the corner of your mat and get you to Jesus. Woo! And they dug a hole in the roof, and you can imagine the moment. There's Jesus. He's just letting them dig dust and dirt because roofs at that time were made out of dirt and, and mud, just falling in front of their face, in front of Jesus' face. And here comes this man. Yik, 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 yik. That, that's the sound of a pulley, you know. But anyway, they lower him down. <laughs> imagine that guy. Jesus walks up to him, and he says some words of affirmation. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus will always touch your heart before he touches you physically. He's more concerned about your heart and the direction of your soul first and foremost. Then he says, take up your mat and walk. That, think about it. He walked. Scripture doesn't tell us how long he couldn't walk, but just, maybe it was a decade. Maybe it was two decades. And that brother, he, he gritted out of there. I'm a, he's like, what's up? See you, fellas. Now, look, I know I'm a white boy. I raised a roof. That's it, all right? I can't gritty that good, but I did it, all right? Don't be judging me on how bad my gritty was, all right? I can raise a roof, though. Yeah, she's laughing, uh-huh. That's all right. That's all right. Jesus invites this man to a whole new life. Spiritually, emotionally, with his friends. Now he can go and enjoy life with his friends without being a burden to his friends. I mean, think. And then we pick up in verse 27. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Let me press pause here and give you some context to a tax collector. This was the job of all jobs to have. You were above the law. You were above authority. You could do anything you wanted. And these were the people who owned it all, had all the houses, lived in the right neighborhoods, drove the right cars, all right, and had the right shoes and clothes on, a tax collector. Jesus Go straight to this man. The first words that come out of the mouth of Jesus to this man is an invitation. Follow me and be my disciple. Verse 28, so Levi got up. This is so powerful to me. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. What did Levi see in that moment that made him leave everything to follow Jesus. I'm going to tell you what I believe Levi saw. I believe Levi saw into the eyes of Jesus, God the creator himself. And he saw for the very first time that which he could not get on his own with his power and authority and position. And because we're all born with this desire, this yearning that only God can fill, no money, no power, no authority can fill that. And for the first time, Levi said, that's what I've been missing right there. Woo! That's it. That's why he left everything. And Scripture goes on to say, later, verse 29, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees, the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law, their long snooty noses and a condescending attitude, they complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Look, go and tell Jesus himself. You got something to say, say it to the man, all right? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. <laughs> if I was Jesus, I wouldn't have said that. I'd have been a little bit more <laughs> specific. But anyway, thank God I'm not Jesus. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. And you can read all throughout the account of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels written by four different men. 
the life and ministry of Jesus, and you can see quickly that one of his, Jesus' top priority, was inviting people to discipleship. He was inviting people to, to, to new levels in their life, in their relationships, and in their marriage, and in their future, in their career. And, and we see Jesus seeks out the sinner of all sinners, Levi, the egotistical, scumbag, narcissistic, self-loving tax collector. And Jesus presents Levi with an invitation of a lifetime. Follow me and be my disciple. Follow me. Here's a better word where we can understand the context of this uh, word disciple. Follow me and be my apprentice. Come and watch me as I love on the Father, and then you, uh, you, as you follow closely to me, you will fall in love with the Father by just watching me. That's what Jesus was inviting them to. That's knowing God. Jesus didn't say, follow me and I'll make you a better churchgoer. Jesus didn't say, hey, Levi, follow me and I'll make you a better rule follower. He didn't say, follow me and I'll make you more spiritual. Because God knows you're not. And the fact that God went after Levi tells me that nobody here is too far gone. Come on, I need to hear amen. And if you believe you are, you have bought into a lie, and whatever you believe determines your behavior, and that's why you've been behaving, behaving that way. And some of you don't like what you're seeing based upon your behavior, back up a step and change how you believe. I'm going to get to that in a moment, all right? There we go. There we go. Jesus said, follow me. He was inviting Levi to this intentional lifestyle. He said, if you intentionally follow me, Levi, then, then I will come in and I will slowly and methodically over a period of time, I'll begin to form you and I'll begin to shape you and I'll make you more like the one you are following. I, I, I'm, I'm not here just to have a conversion, Levi. I'm here to invite you to follow me. And in verse 28, Levi got up and left everything and followed him. It's a lot of paper, a.k.a. money, a lot of power, and a lot of position. When following God, I believe sometimes he'll ask us to lay down and drop things that we think are bringing us true happiness when, in fact, they're not. And some people don't want to give up certain things because you think that you'll lose control or, oh, I won't have that, have that much fun. No, no, no. Anytime God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, asks you to give up something, it's for your better. It is. And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that. He left it all. And he was so excited about this invitation that he invited his scumbag tax friends. He, he had a, a, a party. This fresh new life, this joy that he was experiencing. Can you imagine the buzz on social media? This was in Capernaum. Can you imagine the newspaper that day? If they did have newspapers at the time, the Capernaum Gazette, this would be the headlines. Jesus hangs with hoodlums. Jesus dines with descendants of the devil. I can see this one because this is the biggest lie of the enemy. Is Jesus who he really says he is? The moment you start questioning Jesus or his word, you're on a slippery slope. It is... Satan's number one deceptive tool. Did God say, really? The gossip. Oh, did you hear, girl? No, what? Levi. You mean Levi on 8th and Main, that tax? Yeah, him. Oh, he's a scumbag. Oh, I know, I know, I know. But Jesus, some guy named Jesus walked by and said, hey, come be my DOC. What's that? Oh, disciple of Christ. And he left it all. To follow him? Can you believe that? Let me do a little pastoring here when it comes to gossip. If you hear something in this church about someone else in the church, I want to challenge you. Don't you dare listen to it. Don't you dare entertain it. And don't pass it on. Please hear my pastor's heart here, all right? The moment you and I stepped into church, and when I mean church, I don't mean FFC. 
at the 1115 service. I mean church in general. The moment you and I and our humanity stepped in the church, we messed it up. So let's not do more damage to the church by gossiping and spreading untruths. Amen? So if someone tells you something and they're trying to bait you in and your first response is, wait, what? Pick up the phone and say, well, let's call that girl and see if it's the truth. Matter of fact, let's get her on FaceTime. Let's see how, see how that goes. Why? Because Jesus taught about this. He said, with the measure you use, it will be given back to you. Now, a lot of preachers preach that financially, all right? But Jesus, yes, it can be financially, but it can be anything. So if you give hate, guess what you're going to give back? But not the same measure you gave. He said, it will come back to you, pressed down, shaking again, and running over. Some of you are wondering, man, why am I just filled with hate? Because you've been given hate. As a Christ follower, we are not supposed to do that. Let the Holy Spirit deal with our hate. You want to... Everybody take a deep breath, all right? Now back, back to Levi. It really speaks of who Jesus came for, really. He didn't just come for those who thought they had it figured out, who were good churchgoers. He went after everybody. And the fact that Jesus went after Levi confirms Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned, and we all have a need for God. He invites all people to know him, to know him. And when, when I say no, I mean beyond this, just, oh, I just casually know that person. Remember the first time you had a Krispy Kreme donut? Somebody told you about it. Oh, man, it melts on your tongue. When the light's red, you go in there and you just stick your mouth up under the icing. They'll just pour it in there for you. They'll shoot it in your veins if you want them to. What? See, up to that point, you have not experienced a Krispy Kreme donut. So you can't tell me you really know Krispy Kreme donuts. What Jesus was saying here is that it's an experiential no. It's a Greek word where, where it goes beyond just knowing someone on the surface to this ongoing I-you relationship where I know you and you know me, where you take that Krispy Kreme and you put it in your mouth and you're like, I know now what you've been talking about because I experienced it. That's what discipleship is. That's what Jesus was inviting Levi to. And Levi accepted the invite. He became a disciple and follower of Christ. So, so what Levi actually did, please hear me. If you don't hear anything else, please hear this next idea, this thought. Levi intentionally decided to allow Jesus to start shaping how he thought. He decided, he was intentional about who was going to form his character and his beliefs and his actions. And he said, Jesus, I want you to be the one. And it can't be the other way around. Levi could not have said, hey, Jesus, you know, there's a certain set of ideologies that, that are just non-negotiable to me, and I know they may not line up with Scripture, but I want what you have, but can you take what you have and just kind of fashion it to my ideologies? Is that okay? It doesn't work like that. The Word of God is not considered to be something subjective. And the moment we begin to pick and choose this or that to shape around our ideologies, we're on a slippery slope. And Levi said, I don't want that anymore. I've been living by the ideologies of this secular world, and I'm lonely, I'm hurting, I hurt people, and I don't want to do that anymore. Jesus, I want you to begin to change me. So here's the truth. If we're not actively allowing Jesus, actively and intentionally allowing Jesus and his word to influence and shape and form us, then by default, we're being influenced and shaped and formed by others and other things. 
If you don't wake up every day and intentionally open up the Bible, get on your knees and humble yourself and say, Lord, I need you today. If it not for your grace and your mercy, I would not be here. I need you to speak the truth in my life. I need you to be my influence and shape and form me. Because if you're not intentionally doing that, then unintentionally you're being shaped by something else, by social norms. Some of you are shaped by social norms and you don't even know it. Well, I didn't intentionally, Pastor Casey, go and just decide, well, if you're not intentional about rejecting social norms, then by default you are unintentionally being formed by it. By secular ideas and secular ideology and media messages, you can be influenced by negative peer pressure. That's why I would encourage you mothers and fathers, get your kids in church let it be a non-negotiable. No, we're going to church today. Get your kids, your students here to. They need the influence of the word of God. Get them to the student ministry here on Wednesday nights. I don't care if they kick and scream. Get them here. And it changed their life. If we're not being intentionally formed by Jesus himself, then we're being unintentionally formed by someone or something else. And the Bible speaks frequently about spiritual formation. You can read all over Scripture the importance of intentional discipleship, the importance of intentional formation in the life of a believer. Just because I go to church, I'm labeled a churchgoer, does not include the label of being a Christ follower. Let's go ahead and clear the air there, okay? Because I can go watch the Astros play, but that doesn't mean I'm Altuve. Or better, Greg, uh, Lance. Is that Bergman? Where'd he go to school? LSU. Romans chapter 12, the apostle Paul was speaking some truth into this. Obviously, the, the church at the time was having some issues with, with trying to take both ideologies, Christianity and the Word of God in the world, and blend it. And he wanted to, to have this separation and teach them that it just doesn't work like that. You're not going to like the fruits of it. You're going to be confused and angry and guilty and, and, and depressed. And he said, look, don't conform, Romans 12 two, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And before I gave my heart to Christ and really decided to go beyond just being a churchgoer to a follower of Christ, I've got to tell you, I was good. I was extremely good at conforming to the world. It was really easy. Because when you're going with the flow, it's real easy. But I began to realize I didn't like the fruits of my life when I was conforming to the ideologies of the world. It left me hopeless and empty. When I found Jesus, really when he found me and his grace saved my life, and I determined, I chose to allow him to begin to transform me, it was a game changer. It's by the grace of God since I was 19 years old, I just turned 54, that I've been serving the Lord faithfully since then. And I don't say that in a brag, bragging way. I say that in all humility and grace. Because again, I am not that good. I have a sinful nature as big as anybody else. And I know I have to be transformed every day intentionally to his word or my sinful nature is going to control me. And my wife doesn't like my sinful nature. My kids don't like my sinful nature. My church doesn't like my sinful nature. I don't like my sinful nature. That's why I have to and we have to intentionally every day say, God, take me. Change my life. I transform to you. So the choice is yours. God gave us the power of a will to choose Choose this day whom you will serve. The most powerful thing in your possession is your will. Choose to conform or choose to be transformed. 
And I would suggest, I would encourage you to do the latter. Be transformed by what God says and what his word says. Amen. The fruits of that transformation you will love. Don't you just sense the presence of Jesus? Man. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And if he spoke and made himself known to the the people in the Old Testament and moved through his son, Jesus, while he walked on this earth, and they operated in the gifts of the Spirit, and the church was started, then he's here for us today, amen. That same power is here for us. He's inviting you. It's up to you to choose. Now, I'm going to be the bearer of some bad news. You're going to die one day. Well, thank you. That's really encouraging. But where you live for eternity is your choice now. That's why Jesus came to die, because there's only one way to God in heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ, amen? So I'm inviting you, if you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I'm inviting you right now to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. So every head bowed, every eye closed. This is a very simple sinner's prayer. Come on, bow your head. This is a holy moment. The Holy Spirit is inviting people right now to a whole new level. Stop thinking that it's not for you, because it is, sir. Stop thinking that you're not good enough, ma'am, to be invited. You are. Everyone out loud, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sins and ask you to forgive me. I call you my Lord. You are my Savior. Thank you for saving me. Keep your head bowed. I'm going to ask you to do something else. In a moment, Pastor Grant will tell you what to do if this was your prayer. But right now, with every head bowed, every, every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, and I believe there's people in this room, your heart is pumping right now. You're like, this is it. Today is the day of salvation. Why go on any longer doubting your eternity? Why? And you just prayed that prayer. If you did, guess what? You just got saved. Do something for me. Right there is sitting. Just raise up your hand quickly and say, that was me. That was my prayer. Yeah, just raise it up. And don't, don't just barely raise it up. Come on, raise it up like you mean it. Just raise it up. Say, that's me. Yep. Hands going up everywhere. At least 30, 40 people raising their hand right now that prayed that prayer of salvation. Yep. Come on, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for drawing all men and women to your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for showing these people your grace and your mercy and your forgiving power. Okay, you can put your hands down, but keep your head bowed. Maybe this message was for you. Maybe you're ready to see your life go beyond being just a church goer. Maybe there's some ideology in your life that doesn't line up with Scripture. And you're realizing that 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 might be the problem. Hey, he's a graceful God. He's faithful. He'll take you where you're at. But he'll begin to speak into your life to take you further than what you could do on your own. And that's what's happening right now. So if you believe this message was for you and you want to respond, right there where you're sitting, I want you to raise up both of your hands. Make it like a funnel to the Lord, like you're receiving from the Holy Spirit. And let him begin to download into you fresh revelation. Come on, just lift up your hands. No one looking around. Father, I pray for fresh revelation on your people today of truly knowing you, truly being a disciple and follower of Christ beyond salvation, beyond water baptism, beyond serving and discovering my gifts and and getting in a small group. Lord, let let us know you, God. Let us experience you 24-7. Lord, I pray for fresh revelation. Lord, your mercies are new every day. And Lord, I just speak that and prophesy that over this church. New life. Fresh new life. 
after a time of disappointment, a time of, of sadness, Lord, I pray for just an overwhelming sense of joy and excitement in the Lord. Lord, you're faithful. Your mercies never cease. And Lord, we thank you that you are in love with us and you invite us all. We're all part of the family, and Lord, I'm going to do my part to receive everything you have for me. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Come on, give it up for Jesus. Thank you for joining us for Faith Family Online. We hope this service was a blessing and an encouragement to you. It's always an honor to have you worship with us from wherever you may be. If this is your first time joining us, we want to give you a special welcome. You can text the word FAITH to the number 55498 to connect with us and learn more. But don't stop there. You can join us in person every Sunday at any of our campuses. For more information on service times and locations, go to our website at myfaithfamily.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you soon.